And if I could ask uh, Dr. Vochna Bajpai, uh, who has a particular interest in political thought. And, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, David. Thanks um, very much for inviting me uh, to speak. It's a great um, honor and privilege to um, speak in this distinguished uh, panel. Thank you all also for coming on a Friday evening and uh, taking time out to uh, celebrate with us. Um, we are very proud uh, to be here. Um, my colleagues are a very hard act to follow, but I'll try. Um, when I first came to SOAS in 2006, I had very little uh, prior acquaintance with the institution. I hadn't even been to a party. Uh, I uh, <laughs> knew uh, I had. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm trying to make up now, but uh, uh, I hadn't even been to a party. So, you know, after spending 10 or so years in. Uh, the secluded cloisters of Oxford. Um, uh, that was uh, my immediate background before I came to Soas and I'd grown up in small town India. Um, I knew very little of the department beyond its very well-deserved reputation as a center for excellence in the study of um, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. I knew, of course, of the outstanding work uh, that South Asianists in the department had uh, produced. Uh, figures like Hugh Tinker, like Sri Ram Mehrotra, uh, like Dennis Dalton, as David um, reminded me. Uh, David himself and Sudipta Kaviraj uh, were very well-known figures, even in small-town uh, India, uh, and uh, for South Asianists more generally. Uh, this has been a pioneering department for the study, for the historically grounded uh, study of political thought, um, which is a broad area within which my own work uh, is located. Um, and there were many, many who had inspired me uh, to pursue this line in my own work. Dennis Dalton's groundbreaking work uh, comparing um, aspects of Western anarchist thought and Indian thinking on politics and power uh, comes to mind. Um, also, Sudipta Kaviraj's formulations of multiple modernities, which have, of course, been influential outside um, of South Asia. Now, while I was well acquainted with the work uh, of uh, the department, I had little previous exposure to the ethos, to the distinctive ethos uh, of the department or the people. But a few things were clear to me then as now. First, Soaz's insistence on a serious contemplation of the particular was its greatest strength and needed to be preserved and celebrated in a discipline in which cases, particularly from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, are often treated in a cavalier fashion. Speaking truth to power has often meant, speak, has often come from a very deep commitment to and knowledge of the particular uh, here, and, and that was something which I felt very strongly uh, committed to. It's been deployed very effectively to challenge general theories uh, within political science, uh, to challenge general theories either from the standpoint of uh, the contingency and uh, the density of history. That's been a prominent strand of work uh, within the department or from the standpoint of the layered performances of resistance um, or consent, uh, which is another prominent uh, strand uh, of work in the department, or indeed from the standpoint of alternative trajectories of modernity or democratization that are traced in um, the experience of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. A second point that I felt very strongly about and that Charles has also alluded to uh, was uh, the unique uh, pluralism of the department with uh, regard to um, its uh, approach uh, to theory and method. There were, uh, if you like, many different theories and different methods, uh, different approaches to the particular, different ways, perhaps, of speaking truth to power. The dominant position in the department might be described as the critical deconstructive uh, perspective, which is expertly practiced by many of my colleagues. Uh, Mark um, uh, was just describing it very well. Um, and this has sought to unmask power, uh, to deflate its claims to universality or generality, um, 
and various other grand narratives uh, from the standpoint of the particular. So for instance, grand narratives of liberalism or human rights have been expertly deconstructed as vehicles of Western power or state power, as repressive of social difference or individual freedom. This is a really important strand of work that continues to inspire a lot of us. But there are also perhaps other ways of speaking truth to power, ways which are distinct both from the seamless universalism of liberal narratives, as well as assertions of incommensurability that characterize various post-colonial perspectives. One promising avenue that I, I explore in my own work is offered by what uh, the Pakistani theorist Amir Mufti calls vernacular modernities. And in my recent book, uh, I try to give substance to conceptions um, of secularism or social justice or democracy, which are familiar from Western uh, experience, uh, but to give substance to these, con to these concepts in the context of Indian constitutional and parliamentary debates on minority rights and affirmative action, and to compare some of these meanings with, their, with some of their Western connotations. And I argue that liberal ideas have significantly informed public reasoning on group rights in India, even as these are uh, inevitably inflected by um, indigenous cultural and historical idioms. So Indian conceptions of secularism uh, might be um, described in relation to, say, equal respect for all religions, but this isn't a wholly alien uh, concept or one that is completely distinct uh, from Western uh, notions of secularism. It involves many notions of separation between state and religion. Similarly, vernacular conceptions of social justice have drawn upon egalitarian liberal ideas of equality uh, of opportunity. In other words, liberalism doesn't have to be seen and liberal categories don't have to be seen as necessarily oppressive, imperialist, culturally <laughs> alien in non-European contexts, and nor can they be limited any longer to their Western European or North American provenance. There's a rich potential for cross-cultural comparison of liberal and other normative concepts, which is some of what I try to do in my work. Also, whereas scholars of ideas uh, have typically tended to focus on the great individuals and the great books of political thought, as uh, Charles and uh, uh, David and Mark have mentioned, um, one of the strengths of SOAS has been to look at ideas in practice, ideas uh, as emerging out of concrete political engagement. Um, and this is something that I try to pursue in my own work. Um, so for instance, whereas traditionally Indian political thought has been studied in terms of um, figures like Tagore or Gandhi or Nehru or Ambedkar more recently, I try to argue that political norms have been forged in India also through um, the interactive processes of discussion and debate through which reasons are discussed and debated and renegotiated um, and recast uh, through processes of uh, discussion and debate. This brings me uh, to the last uh, point that I want to make today. Uh, together with colleagues in the department, uh, including Charles, Matt, and uh, Rahul, I'm involved in um, setting up a new initiative on comparative political thought. We believe that our department has a distinctive contribution to make uh, to uh, giving new direction to this emerging subfield within uh, politics. And it's one which moves the focus away from regions and traditions which have traditionally been favored as uh, the units of comparison towards political concepts such as justice or rights or equality, or secularism, and compares the different ways in which these are framed in practices as well as texts. We seek to highlight everyday political thinking forged in the cut and thrust of political engagement as an important realm of political thought, which is worthy of sustained attention alongside more canonical texts. 
um, and we're in the middle of putting together a new master's program on comparative political thought, which, among other things, will highlight the thematic and conceptual contiguities across regions um, that have so far been the main unit of teaching and research um, within uh, the department. In doing so, we are motivated by the conviction that in a period in which economic power is moving away from the North Atlantic world and the straightforward efficacy of military instruments uh, has weakened, speaking truth to power requires more than ever so as his unique contribution to building knowledge about ideas, values, and norms across the regional divisions of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Thank you very much. And finally... <laughs> if I could finally ask Toby, Toby Dodge, another a PhD student who's gone on to great things. <laughs> Thank you. That's a matter of opinion. I'm, um, I'm painfully aware that I stand between you and what's behind those doors, which is hopefully a baccalaureate feast of wine and a few peanuts if we're lucky. <laughs> So I'll try and be brief. Um, I was resident at SOAS in various different capacities for over a decade, as the, uh, the grey hair of my supervisor next to me <coughs> will indicate, from uh, October 1991 until July 2002. As a master's student working, and then working in what was once called the Middle East Centre, then a very long year, from my perspective at least, attempting to learn Arabic, and then finally a much longer period of time writing a PhD and then temporarily teaching both international relations and Middle East politics. Now, as Dave was saying, we left um, and, and tried to forge our way outside the rather comforting uh, walls of this institution, and I didn't quite realize how much of a SOAS product I was until I came across the YouTube cartoon you'll all be familiar with, So You Want to Study at SOAS. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, uh, this certainly brought a wave of recognition, but also, and I think much more importantly, a strong feeling of affinity with the school, its project, which I'm fairly sure is not and shouldn't be speaking truth to power, but could be speaking truth about power, and I'll get to that um, more later. And then most importantly about the, the department, which was my uh, very tolerant home for the best part of a decade. So against that background and with the wine waiting outside, it's left for me, um, in the seven minutes that David allotted me, I just want to say two intertwined things, I think, about the nature of the politics department I was associated with for that decade, and secondly, about the nature of what Dave uh, has mentioned, which we could call the international political conjuncture during that time, and I think how each powerfully interacted with each other. Now, when I arrived at SOAS in the autumn of 1991, I joined a master's degree in the politics of African Asia, which had seven students on it. The entire postgraduate intake for the department that year, if I'm not mistaken, now, the bespoke nature of its postgraduate teaching may well have been swept aside, but what I remember to have been the dominant departmental ethos at the time has had a much greater and, I think, long-lasting influence on me and Dave and, I think, everyone who was in that year and the years that um, followed, and it's purely academic. And I think I would sum up the ethos as being uh, centred on, on a kind of intellectual duality. Firstly, there was a deep commitment by a core group of staff to what Quentin Skinner labelled grand theory. Now, this is clearly Charles, but also Tom Young in the audience, uh, Catherine Dean, and Sadipta Kavaraj. Now, the last three, at least in the 1990s, and you can check with them in the bar afterwards, represented various hues of Marxism or post-Marxism, both the influence of uh, Althusser, but also the powerfully evocative shadow of the Sardinian. When Sadipta joined the department, he also brought with him his work within it with the Subaltern School, with its commitment both to detailed historical research and the application of grand theory. So the second guiding ethos that shaped this department and its influential influence on me, its intellectual influence on me, was not only this commitment to the study of grand theory, but also its application to kind of rigorous empirical research, research about things, as Marx said, about people. This is the major intellectual heritage that I've carried away and continue to operate under from this department. Now, historically, I arrived in the department to study the politics of the Middle East at the start of what we could call, if we were being bold, the long 1990s, in the aftermath of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the US-led war to eject the Iraqi army from the country. Beyond this event, the collapse of the Soviet Union and George Bush Sr.'s rather notional talk of a new world order were making the interface between international relations 
and the comparative study of the developing world a very exciting place to work in. For good reason, it is now hard to capture, I think, the optimism of the early 1990s, where the undoubted bombastic triumphalism of neoliberal public intellectuals, I think then, was counterbalanced by a strong sense of the possibilities of a new mass politics, much possibly comparable to the aftermath of the Arab Spring today, unfettered by the old rigidities of the Cold War. My strongest memories of the department in the early 1990s were a series of possibly optimistic but rather confused meetings that tried to explain this upsurge in democratic mobilization that had touched the vast majority of states across Africa. However, it soon became clear as the Washington consensus solidified into a project with clear hegemonic aspirations that the newly, confi uh, that the newly configured international community without the Soviet Union, led by the international financial institutions, were using the end of the Cold War to impose a systematic program of political transformation on the developing world. And this is the rise of what Dave, I think, very aptly has described as kinetic neoliberalism. And in my work, at least, it led directly to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the carnage of the aftermath that we're still, or more importantly, the Iraqi population are still living with. And I think it's during this period of post-Cold War history that the department's dual commitment to both grand theory and the empirically rigorous study of the developing world came into its own. And this, uh, this approach, I think, is personified by, I think, Tom Young's work and indeed David Williams' innovative work on what they've termed the liberal project, tracing certainly the ideational roots, but also the material ambitions, and most importantly, I think, for us at SOAS, the devastating effect of what we could call a new or at least a revived neoliberal imperialism. It's this type of work that has deeply influenced my own research and writing since I left SOAS. And my work's now primarily focused on US foreign policy, the kind of legacies of neoconservatism, and as I said before, the bloody aftermath of an attempt to rework state society relations in Iraq after 2003. So it's the exacting combination of a detailed empirical research project and a commitment, I think, to philosophical complexity and sophistication that is the lasting influence this department gave to me and that I've carried out into the wider academic world. So against this background, I think talking truth to power would be a dangerous waste of time. <laughs> to be bold, and I know I'm after a cheap T-shirt after I leave, so that I declare an intro. <laughs> Primarily because power almost certainly would not be listening. And in order to gain power, and this with a capital P's attention, co-optation would be the central danger. Instead, I would celebrate and have clearly been deeply influenced by the department's continued commitment to telling the truth to a wider audience about power's effects on the non-European world. And I think that's a much longer, more complex, not as punchy a slogan, but that's <laughs> certainly uh, what I carried out of this department, and long may it reign. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, there will be a vote of thanks at the end, but uh, could I just say personally, thank you very much to all the panelists who I think have given us uh, each their insights into what it is that makes the distinctive SOAS approach to uh, the study of politics, both in the past and the present. Um, so um, we have about 20, uh, just a little bit over 20 minutes uh, till we um, can indeed go and have a drink and talk more informally. Um, as I say, um, it's not just questions. We would like people to make comments. Uh, the only restraint, of course, is, is time. So I will try and restrict people to uh, uh, just a minute or two. And when you um, uh, speak, could you just say you know, who you are in terms of your association with the department? That would uh, uh, help as well. Um, OK, I've got, uh, there are several hands. Um, I think uh, you had yours up first, sir. Is there a microphone? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. And as I say, do do please keep your remarks uh, brief. Uh, just uh, uh, two short questions. Um, first question: How has the problem of the power of 
institutional racism, which is the same as white supremacy, impacted politics at SOAS over the last 50 years? Second question. How could the problem of the power of institutional racism, which is the same as white supremacy, impact politics at SOAS in the future? Mm. Okay, there's a question. Um, anybody like to respond? Mm. Okay, the suggestion is we t take a few questions and then uh, we'll uh, take them together. Um, there and then there. Ahmed Shaibani, a cyber rebel from Libya and the founder of the first political party post Gaddafi dictatorial era, the Democratic Party. I would just would like to add to the chairman's uh, list of prestigious uh, academics who have been um, uh, serving uh, the intellectual discourse from this platform. So us, I would like to say from uh, the prospective Libyan intelligentsia, we regard His Excellency Mr. Anthony Allen as a, a very trusted reference and a Libyan specialist. And across the spectrum, we despise the former student of SOAS, Luis Bernard, who is very anti the Arab Spring uh, uh, uprising and uh, has written very critical articles. Uh, I have no associations with SOAS uh, apart from uh, a family spat that goes back 20 years ago, which I shall s skip. It is to do with <laughs> money coming first. My sister was uh, blocked from final exams a week before on tuition fee <coughs> technicalities. Um, the question I would like to pose to the panel is, um, I gave a lecture a few weeks ago here about uh, that uh, the Arab Spring has made a big opening for us to capture this historical moment mm -hmm. to make a separation between the mosque and the state. And I was astonished while I was deliberating the lecture that uh, distinct, that British Muslim students from Sawas, who are studying at Sawas, openly uh, threatened to kill me while I was de deliberating the lecture. What educational capsule do you feed your student to make them so radical? <laughs> Thank you. There's somebody there in the middle. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I'm Stephen Haggard. I was a, a child of SOAS in the 80s and a student of David's then, and uh, unlike many of the distinguished panelists here, I didn't go on to any further academic study uh, in the area of politics, but was very inspired by what I learned under David. And I'd just like to talk about the effect of uh, um, SOAS politics just for a second for people who haven't remained in the academic field. I went on to be a journalist, I ran Newsnight for a bit, and have then been a filmmaker since then. And I think the voice that I've been hearing from the panel today about paying attention to detail, uh, being critical of all the theories and discourses that you hear, uh, which carry the weight of governments and big machines behind them, um, and learning to listen to the voice of people uh, in the street. These are things that were given to me by my study of SOAS, and I've carried on working uh, in all my life, both in, both in people I know as well, and what I do privately as well as professionally, very much inspired like, uh, by that. And I'd like to just say that that's a legacy which is active not just uh, in the work that you've been doing in your research, but also, I think, in the lives of the many people who've left SOAS and have gone on, not within academia, but just to be uh, ordinary people in the world, uh, inspired by this legacy, and I think it's a great one. Thank you very much. If you'd like to pass the mic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Nasser Kalawun, uh, a student of uh, SOAS, uh, I wouldn't um, say much about Professor uh, Charles Tripp because it's been a long time and I wait 25 years to say any word about this. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> from this point, I want to see uh, if you can focus on the relationship between the professor and the students. Because when I came here, I thought it's a kind of uh, Sufi relationship. Uh, students are supposed to be yes men. 
and um, it didn't work this way. However, for uh, two occasions, I want to uh, see that uh, first instance was Professor Vatukiotis, whom Professor Charles Tripp uh, paid tribute to, the late Professor uh, Vatukiotis. I would say relationship was not easy during the course. However, it built up after the uh, whatever. So t to denote that, that you can build up whatever, I did interview with him. When I called first, after a few years of graduation, I thought he would tell me no. And then he said, no, you are welcome. So anyway, it went up to review books and whatever. So relationship is not restricted only to coursework. It can be built up the opposite way afterwards, as a Sufi or sort of Sufi. <laughs> the other one, the dangerous uh, bit of it, I did a, um, uh, in politics uh, interview with uh, some people, but also Professor Tony Allen, who is here. Um, anyway, about water in the Middle East, assuming that this is a neutral subject, that uh, the censor uh, and newspapers wouldn't uh, spot it. However, there were two passages about Libya, power structure in Libya, and the censor took them out and exactly depicts the situation as exactly happened last year. So thank you for uh, Professor Allen and Professor Tripp for being uh, throwing us into dangerous water. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Perhaps, well, is there anybody else just at the moment? Um, we can just, uh, yes. This is Professor Taylor. Uh, I'm Bob Taylor. I used to teach here a long time ago. I um, just want to make two quick comments. Um, one is that nothing in this department would ever have happened that it hadn't been for David Taylor. I came here in 1980, and the department was, these guys make, and the lady, make it sound all well organized and intellectually coherent. They've left out all the chaos. <laughs> when P.J. Dictiotis was the head of the department, he had not a clue what was going on. In the first meeting I attended of the faculty, David started to explain everything to us, because P.J. didn't have a clue. And finally he turned to David and said, how many students do we have now? And David said, I think it's 33. He says, as many as that. <laughs> and then he just shut up and David took over and ran the meeting. I'm glad to see this tradition's continuing. <laughs> the other thing is, um, our speakers left out the fact of contingency in all the work in the department over the years. Um, I came in 1980, as I said, expecting to teach Southeast Asian politics with Ruth McVeigh, who I think was the first woman on the faculty, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ruth left about six months later, being made redundant under Mrs. Thatcher's first cut university cuts. So I had to teach all the Southeast Asian politics rather than only a little bit. And we had reference to international politics in the department. Of course, when I was coming, the undergraduate degree was being introduced by David, organized by David, run by David. And P.J. Viticliotis came and knocked on my door. He said, um, do you know anything about international relations? I said, no. He says, well, David says we have to have a course for undergraduates in international relations. You're going to teach it. <laughs> so I ran down to the library and started reading up on international relations which is why 10 years later I invented the International Relations Program so I could get out of teaching this course I knew nothing about. So anyway, don't forget contingency in the history of the department. So we've, we've had a couple of uh, comments, a uh, couple of observations, some uh, somewhat um, partial interpretations of the past from the last speaker. Which, uh, <laughs> And uh, I should say that it was always a team effort, and Charles, in particular, who was there at that time, was also part of that team that uh, got the undergraduate program off the ground. Um, but one, one speaker uh, raised the question of, of racism, and I think this is, as Mark Laffey said at the beginning, um, this has been part of, of Saras's history. I think uh, we've all recognized in different ways uh, that Saras has come a long way. Um, that sometimes it was quite painful, and, and I think people in the department were also part of that painful thinking. Um, you know, first of all, um, in the uh, well, I, I suppose it's it's an ongoing process, really. Um, but you only have to look at uh, where we were, where the school was in the 1920s, where it was again in the 1940s, just at the time of um, uh, independence of India, and then later on as, as African countries um, threw off the colonial uh, yoke, um, that Tsarist took its time to respond in many cases. But I think one 
um, if one looks at the way in which um, many different strands of theory have been brought together to look at um, these sorts of issues, um, I, I think a, a lot of progress has been made. The law department has put a great deal of effort into uh, thinking about similar um, issues. The anthropologists have also had a, a lot to say. So um, obviously it may look different from a student perspective, but um, certainly uh, you know, in my 40 odd years associated with the department, uh, one has seen um, that painful process of introspection take place. I don't know if anybody would want to add to that. And then somebody was talking about the student staff, the, the student um, uh, lecturer relationship, which is uh, certainly when I, in, in those early days when uh, you know, the, the relationships were so close because there were so few of us, whether it was uh, students or, or faculty, it was uh, you know, a quite distinctive feature of the in institution. And I'd like to think that today, in, 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 the, era, in the era when we, we have just a small fraction of the department um, here, uh, that nevertheless some of that closeness um, persists. But uh, um, I think the question was addressed should... to you in the first instance. Well, Charles, I yes. don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd take up a point that NASA made, that, and in a sense it goes back to uh, something that uh, our colleague from Libya uh, mentions as well, in the sense that we don't give people a magic pill uh, what we do, of course, is instruct them in the ways that they should question power and they should question ourselves as the teachers of power. And I remember I felt I'd done my job well when, uh, at the stage when the Egyptian Foreign Office was still sending uh, students to do master's degrees at SOAS, one of them came to me at the end and said, uh, we were talking about how he'd enjoyed the, uh, the um, year and what he'd got out of it, and he said, well, the great thing I got out of it is I'm never going to believe anything that anyone ever says to me again. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing where he worked, uh, you wondered what kind of future. In fact, I know what kind of future he had. He's been a, a good dissembler, in a sense, uh, in that way. But I think that there's a serious point there, which is that, as I think Nasser again alluded to, is that people come to SOAS from often, particularly in the postgraduate field, from very different educational backgrounds with a very different tradition of how you approach the text, how you approach the teacher. And I think one of the, I find still, you have to ask the students this, but one of the things that I find so gratifying is the ways in which the space for debate, the space for questioning, the notion of a critical approach in politics itself, as well as criticizing ourselves, has been so much part of the ethos of our teaching and of the department. And so you do get this transition, visible often within uh, the first term or so, of people who have felt timid about approaching a text critically because they feel that who am I to stress it? I remember that myself as a, as a student. Who am I to take on uh, these, uh, these figures, not only the people standing in front of me, but the people uh, whose books I was reading. And I think that if anything that I try to impart, and I hope I do, is this sense of criticize us, criticize what we're reading, and try to persuade students that the books we put on the reading list are not there because we approve of them in some kind of censorious way. In fact, they may be there because they're extremely bad books, but I want students to make the point of that. But of course, you can't ask me about this because I have another ex-student sitting next to me. So uh, you'd have to ask them about the relationship between the Sufi master uh, and, and the Sufi follower. I have something to say about that. Um, it's Catherine Dean not talking about uh, Sufi masters, but uh, supervisors and, and supervisors uh, who said that they, um, that, they, that they rebel and transform themselves in the, uh, to the opposite of their supervisors. And anyone who had the privilege of meeting Vatic uh, knows why Charles is so calm and grounded and very rarely raises his voice, <laughs> which means uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to revert to kind of generation, uh, generation before and, and be the passionate um, arguing declar declaratory supervisor that Vatic, I suspect, probably was. On uh, Bob Taylor and contingency on, in the summer of 1991, I was called in to his office, a very nice office in the Phillips building. I don't think they build them that size anymore. And um, uh, to be interviewed for my master's, which uh, for my master's place, which shows you, I suspect, how things have changed today. I'm sure it's all done remotely. And uh, to try and narrow the contingency of not getting a negative uh, uh, result, I desperately tried to find someone who was on the degree. He said, "No, no, no, it's all right. He really loves Max, Max Weber. He'll always he always asks the same question. He said, what do you think of Max Weber?' So I scuttled away, <laughs> and buried myself in Max Weber, and was <laughs> ushered in with Charles and Bob and." Uh, he looked at me from what then seemed to be a huge height and said, what do you think of Weber? <laughs> <laughs> 
And I paused and piped up, well, sir, um, it's funny you should say that. I've just been reading it. I was very impressed. <laughs> and my entrance to the department was, uh, was assured. <laughs> um, I was actually going to tell a similar interview story uh, involving Bob Taylor. Uh, I was also interviewed um, at around about the same time. Uh, so we both started the program together alongside Tom Young. Mine was going to do with um, Hobbes' Leviathan, but um, where well, we had a similar conversation, but I won't. I, 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 on students and professors, I mean, certainly, I, I, I remember learning a huge amount outside of the classroom, talking often in the SOAS bar, I must confess. Um, and it seems to me, you know, that there is a kind of, well, I experienced anyway, a tremendous openness uh, amongst the academic staff to talking to students, drinking with students, hanging out with students. Um, you know, and, and, and you, know, you know, in some senses, those kinds of moments stick with me, um, sometimes much more than the stuff we did actually in the classroom, certainly when I was first here. Um, and on continuous in chaos, yes, I sort of feel like I was probably at <laughs> various points kind of contributed to both the chaos as a teaching assistant. It seemed, perhaps that was just me, rather, <laughs> um, chaotic at times. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, no, I just wanted to uh, go back uh, to the point about um, institutionalized um, racism. I can't uh, claim to uh, know um, uh, very much of that from um, personal experience, but one of the good things about SOAS is uh, that it's uh, a place which allows for such things to be talked about and discussed, and it's really one of the very few places where so many different types of people rub up against each other. Of course, you know, racism in general continues to exist uh, and it needs to be talked about. Uh, but so as is one of the few places where it can be discussed and should be more openly discussed. Uh, and, um, and that's why it's a place to be celebrated, I think. So that's, that's my take on it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure what I have to add to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I do want to add one small thing, however. Thanks a lot. Um, for me, I think one of the most appealing things about SOAS, ever since I've been here, has always been the students. Um, and in fact, several years ago, I was offered a post at another university, um, and I sat down and I thought about... Um, I, I don't live in London, and so I have a, a commute. It's actually quite a long commute by train um, to get into London. It's two hours by train. And the other university was in my hometown, and you know, it would have been much easier and all that kind of stuff. It's a fairly prestigious university and what have you. Um, and at the end of the day, I sort of walked around the campus, um, and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very... Well, it's Bristol. It's Bristol, actually. Um, and, you know, the students there didn't look like... So is students. Uh, <laughs> I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> but so is, so is students to me, they look like the world. Um, Bristol students don't, um, something else. <clears throat> and anyway, so it's always been for me one of the most uh, attractive features of being at So is, is engaging with So is students. And I think uh, I try to honour that in the way in which I engage with them in my teaching. Um, I'm sure, like other colleagues, it's about trying to open up spaces to enable them to say things that perhaps they're not sure that they can say, or to, to discover ideas that, you know, sort of they're, they're sort of in choy and they've not really sort of worked them through, to make spaces where they can feel comfortable and able to, like, express points of view that maybe they don't hear uh, outside or that are not projected to them uh, through the media or, or which seem to them, like, you know, sort of foolish and so forth. And I think it's precisely out of that interaction with the students that, that makes them the people that they eventually become and which sort of produces... Um, not necessarily precisely what you've described, but um, a certain sort of fierceness, which I think is a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, the, the time is nearly 8 o'clock, and there'll be more opportunity. There will be a, a microphone upstairs in case anybody feels inclined to tell some <laughs> of the more scurrilous uh, stories about the department. I've got one or two myself that I'd be prepared to share. Uh, but before we move out, uh, if I could ask uh, Dr. Fiona Adamson, head of the department, to uh, uh, bring the uh, formal part of the proceedings to a close. Fiona. Okay, well, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Fiona Adamson, and I'm the current 
head of the department, and I have to say I'm a relative newcomer to the department. Um, I arrived in 2007, but in some senses I'm typical of the department because I think about 50% of the department um, has only been in the department for the past decade or so. So when uh, David Taylor pointed out that this year was um, the 50th anniversary of the department, um, most of us um, were very happy to celebrate this, but realized that we couldn't really speak to the history of the department beyond the past perhaps five to seven years. Um, so we wondered how best to celebrate or mark this anniversary, and uh, we decided we wanted to, to do two things, um, to have a panel that would reflect on this history, um, on the accomplishments of the department, and also reflect on the evolution and the changes over time in the department. And if there's one correction I would make, it would be that actually the department is uh, not almost 50% female, but I think we're more than 50% female. Um, and uh, some of you may notice the uh, subtle subtext in the uh, poster for the event uh, that also reflects that. Um, I want to uh, thank the panelists. And I also, um, and I think they've given a, a great um, overview of the history of the department. But I also want us to celebrate current initiatives in the department and also um, current staff and students as well as past staff and students. And we thought that having a party that would bring the different generations together um, current staff, past staff, current student, past students would be the most appropriate way to celebrate um, this department that obviously means so much to so many people. Um, it's a testament to the influence of the department to see so many people here on a Friday evening. Um, and I thought I'd just ask, uh, since it is a diverse group with many different relationships to the department, um, if maybe I could ask the, anyone who is a current uh, staff member in the department to stand now and be recognized. <laughs> a current staff member, yeah, great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you can see the current staff. Um, Anyone who is a past staff member who has come out this evening to join us? I know there's a few. Okay. Okay. Uh, past students and alumni, if you could stand so we can. Thanks, thanks for coming out. And uh, all the current students in the department, if you can stand. <laughs> okay, um, it just remains, I, I do want to thank a, a few people. Um, in addition to the panelists who did a great job, I'd also like to thank um, external relations and events who have both supported this uh, celebration financially, but also spent incredible amounts of time to organize um, the party and to advertise it. I'd like to thank uh, alumni relations, and I would like to thank the various publishers that uh, are here to display and also um, to sell many um, books by uh, department members. Um, Hearst, Zed, Cambridge University Press, Rutledge, IB Taurus, Oxford University Press, many of them have also generously uh, supported this uh, evening's reception. Um, I'd like to thank the student volunteers who are out selling t-shirts. Um, and of course, we encourage you to buy a uh, t-shirt from the evening. 
Um, they're only 10 pounds. Um, most of all, though, I would like to thank uh, one person um, who has spent an incredible amount of time today. I just want to thank everyone, and it's just been a real pleasure to reconnect with people I've known over the years and to see the good turnout. Thank you all. Okay, well, um, the second half of the evening is about to begin. There is uh, their drinks. Uh, Food, music, an open mic, um, good company uh, upstairs. So I'd just like to thank you all for coming and please do join us for the uh, party upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>